So good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay in starting. We had some technical issues. So my name is Zeeshan Mansuri. I'm a senior child and adolescent psychiatry fellow at Harvard, and I'm the founder and CEO of Humans of US Emily. So what we are doing this week is we are continuing on the things that we did two weeks ago where we held the IMG conference, where we basically got speakers from all specialties to come and share their stories with you, as well as give you tips and tricks about the match. We thought that since research is becoming so important, since research is becoming so important, given that step one has become pass fail, as well as international grads need the research to beef up their profile, we decided to hold this session where we make you learn everything from basics of research all the way to original research. So we are starting right now. We'll go all the way to 7 p.m. We just have a lunch break from 12 to 1. And uh, we'll be starting with Kaushal Shah, who is a second year psychiatry resident. So we have Garima and Tejasvi, who are our executive team members who are going to moderate this session. Uh, but before that, I would just like to thank my executive committee for coming up with this. We are working till late night yesterday to keep everything on time. So we have Robin Yadavir, who is our fantastic executive team member and who does the computer and the tech stuff. So you can bug him for all the YouTube stuff that happens or doesn't happen. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Ika Vesh. Uh, he's, she's not here today, but she should be joining us today afternoon. We have Dr. Anish Lal, um, who is also going to be joining us today afternoon. And uh, we know Annie and Ishan are going to present on how to do research during med school today from 10.30 to 12. They are also in our committee. And then uh, we have Hansini, who is last but not the least, and she should be joining us today afternoon. So I wanted to thank all of them, and I give it over to Agarema and Tejasvi to introduce Kaushal and start this research. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first session on research, Roadmap to Research for Residency. And uh, the first session is going to be about the basics of research, approach to literature review, and approach your letter to the editor and commentary. Tejasvi. Thanks for the introduction, Garima. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm introducing Dr. Kaushal Shah, who is going to kick off the session for us. Dr. Shah is current psychiatry resident at Wake Forest University and the research committee chair. He has contributed to an FDA approval and was a leading and inter integral part of a clinical trial. In addition to MB, he has completed his MPH degree. He also pursued MBA while working in Fortune 100 company. In addition to industry research, he has an extensive profile in academic research. He's interested in child and adolescent psychiatry, neuromodulation, and research. He enjoys volunteering, helping medical students, and mentoring residency applicants. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah, for being here. On to you. Dr. Shah, I think um, you're, uh, I can ask you to unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Well, uh, I'm glad to be here and I'm really excited that like we have a lot of people um, interested in research. So that's really nice. Um, so as you mentioned, like our goal is to kind of to keep to the base. Physics, like we just want to make sure that like we cover introduction part of research and and how we can go from there. Like it seems like you have a wonderful lineup uh, uh, of all the speakers that you have throughout the day. So that would be great. Um, so let me share my screen first. In fact, I'm not able to see the icon. Let me check. Okay, here you go. Well, can you see my screen now? Yes, Dr. Shah. Well, uh, so let's begin. So 
we are, we are here talking about introductions of research. So we, like, let's see what we are going to do, go over today uh, together. So I do not have any financial disclosure or no conflict of interest uh, in any regards to these presentations. Um, so as we mentioned, like we are, what we are going to go over, like, so we are going to go over uh, anything and everything which is related to kind of basic research uh, and what we can do uh, in terms of while doing research, uh, including literature search and uh, how to go about uh, writing a letter to editor. So just quickly go over, like I'm not going to talk about a lot of theory because I know like we, we learn a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, definitions and terminology uh, when we talk about research. So very briefly, uh, when we say what is research, uh, basically it says that it is a systematic meticulous investigation of a problem or issue to generate a new knowledge or expand an existing uh, evidences like, um, it is it, the research word itself has been derived from a French word called researcher, uh, which means to go about seeking. Uh, and how we can differentiate a research from a clinical research. So the major difference is that uh, when we have any person or group of person or a subject involved in a research, then it becomes a clinical research. Um, um, based on the history and, and the evidence that we have, the first ever clinical research was conducted by Dr. Lin in uh, 1753 where he studied a uh, uh, few people uh, uh, in uh, like sailors in particularly uh, who were suffering from scurvy and where he started providing or, or had an intervention uh, of citric uh, uh, food uh, uh, items uh, that helped them to cure uh, or improve the symptoms of scurvy. So that was the very first uh, clinical research that we know about. Um, so like I, I was always wondering like why people are you know interested in research um so there are a number of things like that that you know like that interest uh, uh in particular research uh, basically like people might just want to do research someone wants to kind of excel or or build up their cv uh, as most of the imgs they usually they want to do and, and basically also they most of them are also very uh, interested in research. So that's that's really uh, basic, uh, uh, I would say like, uh, like people really are involved in research because of several reasons. And also someone wants to contribute to existing literature or, or what to serve, serve, serve society. Um, um, someone wants to just, as I mentioned, like they want to have secondary gain or benefits in, uh, like career growth, uh, recognition. Um, also, like research is like one way to kind of learn a lot of things uh, while while we are studying or or while we are practicing clinical clinical medicine, we want to practice evidence based at the same time. Um, uh, we want to make sure that we are keeping our knowledge up to date. Uh, so I think one of the things I have learned is like finding a good review article which covers everything and anything about a particular topic is really helpful to to know about a, a particular topic. I know we have a lot of resources like up to date and and other other things that people used to refer or still referring. But uh, uh, having a latest literature review or a review article really helps to um, uh, enhance our knowledge. And when we talk about research, uh, so definitely there are recommended steps or, or processes that people usually um, follow. Um, and, and the first step usually is like literature review. We need to make sure that uh, we do review existing literature uh, uh, and, and know about everything so that at least uh, we know what is... What is... What is currently, Sorry, sir, you can continue. Sure, okay. Uh, so overall we know what is, uh, what is available in terms of evidence and, and what is missing. And, and based on what is missing, we can, we can work on our research proposal or research uh, objective. Um, so in, there is no particular order, but usually uh, this is the recommended order that we should start with the literature review, find the problem, 
figure it out what research design uh, we in particular can implement in for our research. Uh, if we need to use uh, any tool or or collect any data, then how we are going to do that? And and once we have that result, so like how we are going to interpret and publish it. Uh, so uh, like if you go from here in clockwise manner, uh, you can see um, that uh, that is there is a kind of certain. Uh, path uh, or certain steps that we can take uh, if we want to kind of uh, systematically do a research. Um, so what is literature review? Um, so literature review is a process, right? Like uh, as I mentioned, research in itself is a process. So literature review is a part of process. Uh, and basically, uh, it is about reviewing all the available authentic unbiased literature related to the particular topics. And, and, uh, and by doing so, as I mentioned earlier, we will be able to understand uh, what is currently out there, what is the latest knowledge or evidence out there, uh, uh, find out uh, how that particular knowledge or evidence will be helping us to formulate our research question. Um, by understanding existing gaps, problems, and limitations. Um, and once we have those information, we can refine it, we can tailor our research creation, right? Because when we are interested in a particular topic, then usually we want to have, uh, like we, we have certain idea that how we want to go about with that particular question. But the thing is like, we want to make sure that we, uh, uh, use our ideas uh, in a way that it will add current uh, literature and that's the only way we can we can add value to our research at the same time it helps to get published quickly um, so it's just not about doing some research but it's also about publishing right so our literature reviews should be in a way that it will help us to formulate our research questions very well Uh, so what we can do, like where we can search for literature, like we are all aware about PubMed, I believe, right? Uh, PubMed is uh, something that uh, we have been using for a while. Um, so there are databases that that helps us to kind of uh, uh, review or, or look into a particular literature. But in addition to that, like journal articles, like which which are usually uh, also indexed in the databases like PubMed, uh, books, uh, medical organization guidelines. Uh, we have conferences where uh, um, leaders and, 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 and renowned people, those usually come and provide some good insight about uh, a lot of different things that we are looking into, or news articles, and also website like Medscape, uh, appropriates and up to date. Uh, so there are a lot of, lot of places that you can look for literature. Uh, however, we want to make sure that uh, we we first of all figure it out what kind of literature we are looking and how we are going to utilize. Um, so that's very important. Um, and in case if someone has any questions, like they can ask or like moderator, they they can they can help us to kind of figure it out uh, how they want to kind of take the questions. Um, but yeah, uh, feel free to interrupt or or put your questions in the chat. So databases for literature, right? As I mentioned, there are a number of databases that are, that are available out there, like starting from Medline, PubMed, PubMed Central, uh, PsychInfo, uh, Embase. Um, those are usually uh, the databases that people usually refer. In addition to that, like we have Scopus, Science, Direct, Web of Science, Google Scholar, clinicaltrials.gov. So there are a number of places that we can look for literature. It could be repetitive as well, like, uh, a particular publication might have been listed to uh, PubMed or Pompeii Central, so they might have listed in, in, in uh, PsychInfo uh, or Embase. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, remove any duplicates uh, if we are counting up an, a number of publications of literature in case if you are doing systematic review. And we are going to talk about it once, once we get there. Uh, but however, like it's, it's very important that we are aware about this particular uh, or uh, all the databases that are available. And I'm not saying that these are the only one, but these are the mostly used uh, uh, databases that we have. Also, um, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, 
what we what uh, what field in we are in right like for example if you are doing a, a research in, in in psychiatry uh then apa has like psych info uh, which is a psych related or psych related uh or database and uh, it's, it's a good to have in our uh search because at least we know that what were the important articles were available they were listed in this particular database and we have reviewed uh at least at minimum right um uh, so that's one thing uh if in case if you are looking for a clinical trial uh, uh or clinical trials then uh us government has a website called clinicaltrials.go so any any clinical trials um which are being conducted uh in us uh, they must be registered uh, uh, uh through this website so they have all the index number id and everything uh, what publications related to that clinical trial they have published so they have linked to, to towards the to to that um so it's a wonderful um resource that we have uh if if we are talking about uh clinical trials like rct or open level Uh, so my recommendation is to go at least with four databases um, uh, because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, for example, if we talk about a publication uh, that happens in JAMA, right, uh, they might choose to just go with the PubMed or PubMed Central, but they might not uh, want to index in any other um, databases, right? Um, but it might be not true for another journal, and and they might be only indexed in embase not in uh, medline for example uh, so basically uh, we want to make sure that we cover everything uh, that is possible uh, we don't want to uh, eliminate any uh, good literature out there uh, just because we are limiting our databases and and one thing that usually the reviewers like if you go ahead and publish something uh, while with the help of uh, databases then like reviewer might say that like why you have used only one or two in itself because it's limiting factor right like it's, it's kind of uh limiting your search and uh that's not a good sign in or good quality paper if even it gets published so basically you want to make sure that uh we include all the databases yeah and always i i i feel like you know when you are doing research uh we want to make sure that like we our we do our um due diligence in every possible way uh, because it's just not us like while we are writing we are we are reviewing our paper but like when it's published uh is it, it is usually uh, reviewed and seen and read by like a lot of people out there uh uh and and your name is on that right paper so you you want to make sure that like you value that thing a lot so one thing uh uh, is like how to do literature search, right? Uh, so there are a number of ways to do it. Uh, but in this day and age, everyone knows about hashtag, right? Like on Instagram or, or Facebook or, or Twitter, people know about the hashtag, right? So uh, in the same manner, uh, I would say uh, while doing literature search, uh, there, is, there are some terms or terminology uh, that, that helps us to uh, cover all the possible terms uh, uh while we are searching uh literature like for example uh, it could be depression it could be depressive symptom uh, major depression right so there are a number of ways a depression can be called out but uh if it is being controlled or it is being uh unified in a way that we can use just a one particular term uh for all the existing available terms then uh, it solves a lot of issues in terms of looking for literature uh, and that's what it is called mesh terms. Basically, mesh mesh terms, which is a medical subject heading, uh, is a control and organized terminology by uh, National Library of uh, Medicine, uh, NLM, and it includes the subject headings in Medline, PubMed, NLM catalog, and other NLM-based databases. Um, so it's a very good uh, way to start our literature search to identify what terms or terminologies we are going to use uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, we go ahead and use this particular terminology so that we include all the possible literature uh, and it's a very first step to identify right uh, so mesh terms has been used for searching indexing and cataloging um, 
and let's go into particular example right and we can figure it out uh, if you just type it in, in the in the Google Match catalog, you it will take to this particular website. Are you able to see my other screen, Match term screen or not? No, Doctor Shah. We can uh, only see the PDF. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think I need to stop sharing and then restart. Uh, yeah. Can you see my other slide? Yes, now we can see. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is what I was talking about. Um, when we Google Mesh catalog, it will take it to a website Mesh, right? This is this is this is a particular uh, website that we can look mesh and identify mesh terms that we are looking for, right? Um, so let's say uh, that we are looking for an article related to depression. We will will kind of come up with uh, a particular topic, you know. Uh, uh, but let's say you know what is depression. Like if we look for depression, you will see a lot of different uh, terminologies related to depression. So I don't know what what particular terminology or mesh terms I'm going to apply, right? Uh, so one thing that you can do is like you open a particular uh, mesh terms and see what definition they have implied, and under that uh, you can see what are the entry terms. That what what does it mean? Like entry terms, it means that instead of you putting different terminology like depression, emotional, emotional depression, uh, depressive symptoms. You don't need to use separate terms like this term separately. You can use only just one word as a depression uh, because all of this has been converted into this particular uh, mesh term, uh, which is a control terminology. And it has, they have put in uh, mesh unique ID. That means uh, this has been tagged with an ID. Uh, so we don't need to use different terms. Uh, instead of that, we just use a term called depression. Okay. Um, similarly, uh, we can go and go on like what exactly we want. Uh, let's say, for, for example, depression post partner, right? Like so, the, just a depression word doesn't doesn't cover the postpartum depression. But if you are looking at literature which is related to postpartum depression, then we don't need to. Uh, type in different uh, entry terms like we don't need to type in uh, postnatal depression uh, or, or a number of variation that could exist for that right but they have solidified uh, and and came came up with they came up with a control terminology um, and they have provided here the definition as well what, what does it mean right so sometimes like uh, we want to make sure that we read this definition um because our perception or our understanding of a particular term might be a little different than what they have interpreted and how they have interpreted uh, so it's very important mm, like for example bipolar disorder right uh, and when we i just typed in depression it it came as this particular search uh, term like bipolar disorder uh, which is a mesh term, uh, but it will cover all of these things that we are, which, which might be possibly we are looking into. Um, you know, manic depression or, or depression, comma, manic uh, or manic disorder. So we want to make sure that like we, we do uh, our part in identifying mesh terms first. So that's one part, right? Uh, and uh, let's say we want to uh, search um, uh, depression in child and adolescent, right? Uh, this is our topic of interest. 
right uh, depression in child and adolescent so that's uh, that's our kind of objective we want to let's say write and review article um, about depression in child and adolescent uh, then our goal might be uh, or should be that uh, we we find existing literature but first thing is find out the mesh terminology uh, so when I say, you know, like depression, right? So like there are a number of things. I don't want to look into the bipolar. I just want to say, hey, you know, I want to just look into simple depression or MDD related uh, uh, or not just MDD. I just want to say moderately intensity, uh, usually moderate of moderate intensity in contrast with MDD. Uh, so I just want to go with this, right? Like oh, I don't want to do in, go into bipolar or anything else. Then this is my match term right now. Uh, so I will just put it here. Uh, so let's say I will put it here. Okay. Now child and adolescent, right? Do we have any uh, a match term for child? Seems like yeah, we do have, uh, and it will include uh, anyone between the age of six to twelve years, um, and it won't include anyone about twelve. Right, uh, and it won't include anyone under six. Um, uh, and this is the mesh term that they have, right? And uh, if you want to look into further by age group, like let's say you know we can click here and then we can we can see you know what age group falls under what. So you can look into play 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 with this particular website. But here we have another mesh term. Well, okay, uh, my area of interest is only uh, people with age six to 12. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to write child. Right, I'm going to write child. Okay, and then uh, now next is like, I also want to look into anyone who is about uh, 12 because I don't want to exclude anything. So that's the reason it's called adolescent, right? Uh, so, Yeah, here it is. Like you know, there's a person like so. Basically, the definition says it's between th thirteen to eighteen. So we are covering the population from six to eighteen. We are not covering anyone under six, right? So that's our objective. Uh, so we have uh, three terms, and I took this example as a very simple example because I didn't want to complicate. Uh, uh, when we have an objective with a lot of different uh, terms, then it could get a little complicated uh, and you might want to use it a Word document and just uh, put it all the all the information in a, in a Word document and like uh, have the mesh terms in there and you can just uh, uh, formulate the string that I'm formulating directly on, on here, right? So we have a mesh term called depression, child and adolescent. So uh, our objective is uh, depression in child and adolescent, right? So we need to combine it. So there is a concept called Boolean operator. Uh, Boolean operator, like if anybody is aware about, you know, some sort of language in computer uh, or SQL, uh, yeah, uh, they might be familiar with, you know, uh, Boolean operators. Uh, basically, what it does, it's uh, like it helps to generate a query uh, by using uh, words like and or uh, uh, those are the words that we can we can we can use uh, uh, when when uh, when using boolean operators. There are three boolean operators that we usually use: and, or, and not. Uh, those are three boolean operators that we use. Um, and that's not the only way we can do the literature search. We can use uh, quotations uh, if you want. Uh, uh, and there are a number of other ways we can do the literature search, search, but this is like a like very basic. Uh, and if you can see, there is also an advanced level of search that we can do, but we are not going to go into that because it will make things very complicated uh, at this point of time. We want to make sure that we just understand the concept, right? So our again coming back to our objective, uh, depression in child and adolescent. So basically, our search. Uh, should uh, include depression, and we are now creating the search string. So depression, and uh, when when we do uh, search, we want to make sure that we nest or we club things together uh, uh, so that PubMed will understand our query, right? So I want to put child and adolescent, right? So depression, 
uh, and child. But now, when we say depression in child and adolescent, but like I want to have uh, literature research result which contains uh, information about child also adolescent. So I will put or. Okay. So I have used boolean operator and, and I have used boolean operator or. Uh, now I'm going to search. Right. Uh, let's see what results. How many results do we get? So we usually get one one eight eight one six. So this is this. This these are the number of results that we received. Right. Not going into further detail, uh, but I want to see how it will impact if I use instead of child and adolescent. That means that I only want to look into articles which talks about both child and adolescent both together, not just child or not just adolescent. Right. So technically it should reduce the number of uh, results, but let's see what it does, right? So instead of 118, 816, what is the difference? It has reduced, right? It has reduced like one third, uh, 37448, right? So this is this is what it happens. Like it's, it, it brings uh, the number of results that we are actually, or, or it will be more focused, I would say, right? Um, let's say if I want to look only child and not adolescent, right? So if I put not, there's another, I don't usually use not because uh, it kills the purpose of our literature search. Like when I start something uh, to look into, right? Like if, if there is a topic that I'm interested, I don't want to eliminate anything at the very beginning. I want to start like from like broader, broader perspective. I want to start, uh, uh, looking into things which are which are maybe unnecessary at this point of time or a little bit more than I am looking for, but I'm looking, uh, making sure that I'm not eliminating any good articles or, or articles that will add value to my research question. So let's say I have used not, what happens? Yeah, it, it further reduced, right? 30175. So if we are talking about depression in child uh, that is the age between 6 to 12 we have this many of articles um, and just going with the original question right depression in child and adolescence i'm going to put back or uh, and it will increase the number of results here they have a lot of good tools right like they have here what year that you want to filter out we, we are if we don't want, want want to worry about you know anything about like before 2000, 2000 year 2000 then we can just filter it out and it will it has reduced the number of results right then also let's say that i want to only look into the original articles right so additional filters that's that is additional filters uh, so let's say i want to only look into the clinical trials uh, nothing more than that uh so i say like like the clinical studies uh, okay um and uh and sure so once i click that i want to make sure that so that that option article type uh is is now here so i click here now so that it will research everything so it it brought results to 9157 now, if you want further kind of say, oh, I want to only have English articles, not more than that, right? Any, not, not anything else than English. So I'm going to go and uh, find English. I'm going to click here. Uh, and then I'm going to select English. Uh, it reduced the numbers uh, to 8911. Um, so there are different uh, filters that you can use. You can also use age, um, but we already use the age criteria for us, but uh, he, this is the other way you can do as well. Um, if you want to look into males or females, um, uh, if, if you want to only look into humans, and this is very important, I usually use this, like so like humans, because there are a lot of preclinical studies that we have so we don't want to include those um so i'm going to select humans now so it reduced further to 8906 right uh, and we can 
reduce like i say okay i don't want to look into like 20 years i only want to look into last 10 years uh, then it will further reduce the number of articles right so this is this is how we can play around with this pubmed uh, there's advanced search criteria where we can create number of different strings and then combine together um, I'm not going to go into that because that's a little bit advanced level um, and and definitely uh, there are a number of resources out there, uh, NIH or NLM, uh, National Library of Medicine, they itself have very good videos how to conduct a literature search on their databases. So you can refer to that for sure. Um, but let's say if you know you don't you are not interested in clinical trials, but you are interested in meta analysis because meta analysis is a very good um, resource that we have, right? Uh, it's the highest level of evidence in this search. So I, if I want to look on, into meta analysis, like there are one three zero two, like so. Um, so basically, we got the idea, right? Um, uh, how we can use this database in order to search. And and if you want to say over search, you can use save, you can uh, use the clipboard, uh, you can uh, export um, in an Excel format. So you can save your search uh, very easily. Uh, one thing is you can always create your profile uh, and, and uh, so that it will be easy. Uh, your email is attached to that particular profile and can send to your uh, email very easily uh, and everything is tracked um, and it helps you to kind of remember uh, what you have been looking for right because sometimes it takes multiple of times or multiple sittings to come up with an idea uh, because uh, going over a few articles itself takes a lot of time uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we save our uh, search criteria we save our um, uh, objective or if you are narrowing down our objective then what we are thinking so that really helps to have your um, profile any questions so far anything that you want to talk about or anything in particular that that we are looking to uh, at this point of time like do you think that uh, we have enough of um information right now so far uh, related to literature search uh yes dr Prashar. i think uh, we have enough uh, information for the literature search okay. would you like to take up some questions now or would you want to wait until the end of your uh, topic to take up all the questions together uh, I think we can we can take all together um, or at least we before we start the letter to editor uh, so that at least uh, we can divide the session into two uh, letter to editor won't take much of time but i'm going to wrap up this in like five to ten minutes uh, this particular particular and we can take five five minutes of uh, uh, questions all right uh, so let me go back to my slides So this is what we are talking about. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay. Dr. Shah, we are not able to hear you. Think okay. You're... Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. It seems like. <laughs> okay. So, uh, when we talk about type of research, um, uh, just to simplify that concept, uh, we can we can say it's a qualitative research or quantitative research. So, any research includes the data uh, or any data that you might be analyzing or uh, or collecting and then uh, analyzing then. Uh, it falls under quantitative research and qualitative research is like 
reviewing the existing literature and coming up with some objective and, and then publish it, right? Uh, so that is that is a difference between those two. I'm pretty sure that there are several other ways to classify research, but we want to make sure that we uh, keep this uh, you know, session in, in a more practical aspect. So what should be a research question or how, or what, kind of, what, what is a good research question, right? Um, so basically any research question, which is uh, feasible to do, right? Like uh, we don't want to come up with a research question which will, which will need cohort study, right? Like or need a RCT um, because uh, we don't have resources to do that. Right? Uh, so it should be, uh, feasible in uh, that's particular. Also, it should be con cu current uh, topic, right? We don't want to do anything which has already been addressed or, or the objective has already been addressed in the previous uh, um, uh, previous publications or previous research. Uh, uh, so the topic should be current uh, and it should be novel, right? Uh, also, we should look into the ethical and, and safety aspect of it because like, for example, if we are doing a research uh, related to humans, like the most of the time, like even at the smallest level, at, at maybe say at the academic center, they want us to fill out an RB application, uh, which makes sure that um, we are not doing unethical things and we are not harming our subjects, right? Um, but in case if you are doing that particular kind of research, uh, but it's good to know that like why it is important, like ethics uh, and, and the safety of our subjects. Um, and it should be relevant, like, uh, and it should add value to existing literature. Like, right? so the, those the research question should address or cover these aspects uh, to make sure that uh, our research question is interesting enough, uh, not just for us, but also if we are publishing it, if if if, if uh, the readers uh, of that particular journal will will uh, help or that will help them to understand that particular topic uh, better compared to what is out there currently. And so I have classified this research uh, articles or research uh, uh, in a way that uh, we can publish it, right? So here we are focusing on publication, how we can publish something. Um, uh, how, because like research is so broad that like we can talk about like number of days uh, about it. Um, but here our focus is that how we can increase our publication or how we can get involved in a way that uh, there'll be some work, our work will be out there. So I have, I have categorized into six. Uh, uh, the first is editorial commentary or brief reports. The second one is uh, case reports or case series, uh, review articles, original articles, and meta-analysis. I'm pretty sure we, we must have heard about this uh, for sure, but we want to make sure that uh, we know um, what it is. And I'm going to briefly go over it. Uh, so let's say editorial opinions or commentary of brief reports, right? Basically it's a narrative review, but at the same time, uh, it's an expert opinion. Uh, uh, it's a perspective piece. Uh, uh, it might be an opinion. It's like, like writing a blog, right? But if, if anyone writes a blog, you might not be interested, but if someone like a renowned person who will write even 140 character, you might be interested in that, right? So basically expert opinion or, 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 or something valuable, which will be helping to understand that uh, particular topic uh, will be more interested in that. So the length of the article is, gen is general specific. Uh, it could be like 600 to 1000 or 1500 words. Um, uh, so you want to make sure that like your topic or what you are writing uh, is very specific to that particular journal and, and, and always check the guidelines because uh, there are a lot of formatting that goes into that. And also, um, if you are beginning uh, publishing something, it might not be possible to publish these things because it, the journal might want us to go, like they only want from experts or they, they it, it might be just uh, on invite basis, right? Uh, so uh, uh, always involve some senior authors, always involve someone who is renowned um, and, and, and you can go from there because uh, uh, it's easy to publish at the same time, it's not easy to get in. So uh, that's the kind of bottleneck that we have uh, if you're talking about this particular type of articles. Um, 
And the next one is case reporting cases. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware about it. Like you have seen number of abstracts and number of posters uh, in conferences uh, related to case report and case series. Uh, just to kind of briefly summarize what it is, case report, uh, usually it talks about a rare, unique, or unusual medical occurrence uh, through clinical cases. Um, it helps to kind of understand some kind of uniqueness uh, uh, about a particular patient, which can be used uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in our practice. Even though it's not the highest level of evidence, like it's, it, it, we cannot generalize it, you know, it's just because it's just a one case or two case if you are talking about case series. Uh, but it's, it's good to know because rare, rare cases, uh, like there is not much, or there, we cannot do uh, huge RCTs or, or, or different kind of research that we want to do for rare diseases uh, sometimes. Uh, so that's the one thing that you know, uh, case report helps. Uh, there's always limitations in there, but uh, it talks about rare, unique, and unusual medical occurrence. And uh, if we have more than one case or one uh, particular patient had the same phenomena, uh, then it's called case series, right? Uh, so it's a comp compilation of individual case reports uh, uh, with similar unique clinical value. Um, so um, let's say, you know, for example. Um, there was a case I read that uh, valproic acid causes thrombocytopenia, right? Uh, um, and so there's only one case there out there. Uh, it was published, I guess, in BMJ. Um, and uh, so they talked about that particular case, how they handled that case, what they did in, in that kind of situation, how they managed that patient. So it provides a lot of good information. Uh, uh, it, 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 it depends. Like, should we should we take all the information and implement it in our patient, or it's, it's it's just good information, right? So that is something you need to decide based on that. Uh, but uh, always you will find interesting cases out there. Uh, when we talk about writing case report or cases, I'm I'm pretty sure that you have another session for an hour about it, so you'll get to learn a lot of things about. Uh, but you know. It is very general specific. It could be 600 words up to 2000 words, or it could be more than that. Uh, so always check with the journal, right? And, and journal, not a lot of journals uh, publish case reports because uh, since I mentioned, it's not, not the highest level of uh, evidence in the search triangle uh, or, or pyramid. It, it usually, um, uh, it's usually at the lower level. So, uh, since it's just uh, one or two cases or few cases that they talk about. Um, the other thing is uh, review articles. So review articles could be narrative review or systemic review. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about it because we can talk about like a uh, full day, uh, how to do systemic review. Um, but the narrative review is like, a, I think uh, the lengthier version of, uh, of a brief report, um, basically, uh, you use search uh, criteria uh, based on your objective. And uh, uh, after that, you start writing in, in, in a way uh, that journal publishes, right? So when we talk about all the review, uh, you can see the traditional or narrative reviews here, right? Like this section, which is the most, uh, I think the major chunk of the, all the reviews. And then in yellow, you can see the systemic review. Um, so systemic review, basically what it does is like uh, it systemize or, or it has certain criteria that we use uh, so that anyone who uses that criteria, uh, criteria, then they, they can come up with the same results. So it's, it's more systemized and that's the, that's the way it says, that's the reason they say it's systemic review. Uh, and if, if, if someone used that systemic review and extract the data from that uh, published papers and do meta-analysis, uh, then it's called meta-analysis. And that's what we see in the, another color inside, right? Uh, so that's the kind of brief information about um, systemic review and narrative review meta-analysis. Um, yeah, and uh, basically this is the structure of the systemic review. Um, they have Prisma guideline. Uh, you can look. At, you can look into that. Uh, 
they have Prisma chart that we need to include when we publish it. Um, and uh, so these are different sections, title, abstract, interruption, methodology. In systemic review methodologies, it should be very robust. Uh, it should explain what we have searched, how we have searched, what number of articles we uh, got in our initial uh, search, what databases did we use, uh, what were our inclusion criteria, what were our exclusion criteria. Uh, so that in particular makes our like the systemic review different from the narrative review because narrative review doesn't have that robust methodology. Then we have results, uh, discussion, conclusion, reference, and funding. These are the like major criteria. And if you look into Prisma guidelines, just Google Prisma guidelines. It will take you to the prisma.org um, and uh, it will have all the steps, how you need to do it. Or they, they have Word document uh, and a checklist uh, that you need to follow. Uh, they have like, for example, in title, like if you are publishing something in systemic review, they want you to include that it's a systemic review. So let's say, you know, systemic, let's say um, uh, uh, a particular topic, you know, depression in child and adolescent, uh, then it should include a systemic review. So that should, uh, so they are very stringent in that way uh, to be like, to, to, to make sure that like, we have covered every aspect of systemic review. Um, so this is how Prisma uh, chart will look like uh, they have the newer version as well. So basically how many databases we have searched, how many uh, duplicates we removed, how many number of articles we uh, screened, uh, how many were eligible, uh, whether we just used did the qualitative analysis synthesis, which is just systemic review, or did we do meta meta analysis as well, which is a quantitative synthesis? And when we talk about original articles, um, original articles, uh, as I mentioned, you know, if it has some kind of data, whether it's a primary data or secondary data. Uh, primary data is like, you know, if you collect uh, data by yourself, like let's say, you know, you implement some survey and you collect data from uh, patients or subjects um, and then you analyze and then use it in your application. That's the primary data, right? And the secondary data is like something which is already out there, like on CDC website, you can see a lot of different databases like Enhance, uh, YRBSS, um, and, and uh, NSDU edge, there are a number of uh, databases that are available out there and you can use those uh, national databases and analyze those databases and, and come up with your hypothesis or object, objective. Uh, so that's the reason it's called original articles. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, meta-analysis, uh, it also falls under that because it has uh, data and we analyze something. So I would say we can categorize under original articles. And this is what I, to, I was talking about, level of evidence in research. So basically, uh, it's very important to know because uh, we definitely want to practice evidence space at the same time, what, what kind of evidence we have, right? So they have categorized into different levels of uh, evidence. At the top, you can see meta-analysis and practice guidelines. So basically the practice, practice, practice guidelines, for example, it, it is coming from uh, a particular organization like APA uh, or or AHA or uh, like big big organizations, right? Like they write guidelines, the expert write guidelines based on the existing uh, evidence, which is like meta analysis and randomized controlled trial. So that's the kind of topmost it, it falls under. Uh, then we have meta analysis. Then we have RCTs, cohort studies, case control studies, uh, case report and cases. If you see. Uh, it is at the bottom, right? So uh, the level of evidence is increases from bottom to top, uh, and the case reporting cases at the low, at the bottom of it. And animal and laboratory studies, like which are usually the preclinical studies, uh, and and there, there are no humans involved in there. Um, so you can see this at the lower level uh, of evidence. We need to know, like, and that's the reason, like, people don't uh, use evidence from case reports, like immediately like do you want to weigh in whether is this even talking about 
the thing that I'm talk, looking into, right? It might be interesting to know, but it might not be useful in our clinical practice. Uh, I think that's, that's about uh, introduction to research. Um, any questions? Let's take some questions right now and then we can quickly go over um, later to editor. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Um, so I have a few questions that were posted in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions was about, um, like from all the studies that you have uh, um, kind of, you know, introduced to us, uh, which study has the most, most strength and ability to get multiple citations? So citation is like, uh, I would say it, it all depends on what objective is that. So there are a number of things. Uh, for example, like whether the, uh, topic is current or not, right? So it, it depends on your research situation, whether uh, how many re readers will be there, right? If, if you don't have enough of readers who are interested in that particular uh, topic, then people won't read about it, right? For example, if I just write about psychiatry, uh, it will be mostly read by psychiatrists or primary care, right? It won't be read by a lot of other specialties. Uh, so it all depends on your topic as well, as well as uh, other thing is you can, when you publish it, like whether it's pub getting published in an open access or, or a paid journal, that means uh, basically uh, whether that article is available freely to all the readers or not. Like uh, I don't want to take names of journals, but like there are open access uh, available where authors need to pay. Uh, uh, to be open for everyone, like for example, the JAMA Open Network, right? So any any publications uh, published in that particular uh, journal, uh, it will be available. It will be accessible by all the readers. Like right? readers don't need to pay because it's being covered by uh, uh, covered by authors. Uh, so that's one strategy you can apply, like having current or novel idea, interesting enough that most like a lot of pop people will read about, um, then publish it in open access journal. Uh, that's the one thing to go about. Uh, and right in the beginning of a particular in, uh, uh, area, like like if it's innovative, like for example, in COVID, right? Like when COVID started, uh, there were not many articles related to COVID, look into any uh, field of medicine. Uh, like and if you have published something in, in the very beginning, all right? Uh, then uh, people will read your articles, uh, like pub publication. They will cite your publication, and 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 it will be read uh, and covered by a lot of news articles or like new newspapers uh, and also uh, TV channels. And so you have a lot of room uh, if we if we start picking up the topic very early on. Uh, we don't want to like kind of uh, hold our idea until like a lot of other people publishes, right? Um, and like putting on research gate, for example, uh, it also helps a lot of people to read that article because people, uh, some, I know several people that, uh, they only use research gate to update their knowledge. So research gate is one, another thing, uh, that you can, uh, uh, look into and, and see if, if there is something that helps, uh, you can use Twitter to kind of advertise or like, you know, uh, how to increase the number of readers. Uh, you can put it on LinkedIn as well, right? So there are a number of ways you can kind of propagate or like, you know, spread out your, your work out there. And it's, I think it's very important. It's a great question. It's very important that, you know, we are not just writing for ourselves, right? We want to make sure that uh, people read about it, people criticize about it, uh, because uh, it should be open for criticism as well, because it will help us to enhance our knowledge. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great question. Any, any, anything that I can help uh, other than this. Thank you so much. I think that answers my question. I would uh, invite Garima to ask her questions. Uh, morning, Dr. Shah. One of the questions they are repeatedly asking in the uh, chat box is, can you shed some light on Cochrane and uh, Scopus? Yeah, uh, so basically when we talk about um, systemic review, right? Cochrane, um, there's history behind it. Like uh, uh, I think Dr. Cochrane, um, uh, they started and they have stringent guidelines how to publish is like and so basically uh, anything published under that uh, is uh, we can definitely say that it is very quality work. 
so you can always look into uh, Cochrane uh, and uh, um, and and see if if something that you can uh, work towards that. Also, uh, I think Scopus, right? I think it's this database. There are different databases that you you can you can use. Uh, in addition to what we talked about and you can include in your search criteria so basically if you are looking into a systemic review or like working on systemic review you can use those databases and and then include in your search criteria and uh, um and 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 uh, expand your uh, search with the help of more databases but i would say when we talk about cochrane uh, um it has uh, very quality quality work uh, and and i would definitely um take it like you know i would say it's like kind of a, a holy book that like when it comes to systemic reviews and and and, and the articles that are published there thank you so much dr shah that answers my question tejasvi Yes, um, I have another question um, that was specifically asked about mesh terms, and we have two questions uh, mm -hmm. around the same topic. So one is, what, what's the difference between using mesh term in not, mesh and not using mesh terms? So what's the difference between our uh, search results? Uh, so when we don't don't use the mesh terms, um, one thing that it could happen is that we might be eliminating a lot of articles. Uh, and uh, when we are doing a literature search, and that could be picked up by the reviewers. For example, if I receive a manuscript and they then they have not used mesh terms, um, definitely they have explained in their methodology section that they have used these terms which are not mesh terms. But I was like, why didn't you use the mesh terms? Like it's a norm, right? And and, and uh, because the norm uh, we have norm of using mesh term because it ensures that we don't eliminate any articles, right? uh that's very important like and as i mentioned uh, in my example for example like if if i didn't use the depression and if i use use just the major depressive disorder then it might have eliminated uh, uh number of results uh that we are looking into and then it will further narrow down our uh, conclusion or results uh, that we are we are trying to uh, kind of uh, uh, Tell it down, or or or, or what or what our objective is about. You know, so uh, it, it's it's always good to use mesh terms, and not all the databases uses the mesh terms, but it will help you to kind of uh, uh, put your methodology in a very structured manner. That you have used mesh terms for this databases and for not not mesh terms in other databases. Uh, so, uh, like for example. Uh, and every database has their like a section called how to do the literature search. So you can always look into that. Like for example, mesh terms have been used by Medline, PubMed, PubMed Central, PsychInfo, Embase. Um, those are the databases that they usually use mesh terms. But like uh, Science Direct or Web of Science or Google Scholar, they don't use mesh terms. But you can still use those mesh terms terminology. Uh, and, and say, okay, we have applied mesh terms for all the databases and for the databases that don't use mesh terms or they don't go by the mesh terms um, on, uh, um, uh, logic, then we have used additional uh, uh, terminologies, right? And it also, as I mentioned, it, it helps to control or, or, or uh, standardize a particular word. Um, so uh, let, me sh let me just provide you an example, right? Why, why we want to... For example, um, let's say our topic was depression and child and adults, right? Okay. If I search briefly, it comes to 1302, right? But let's say I will say major depressive disorder. And, and if, I, if I search, would it increase or decrease? It decreases the number of results, right? So you are eliminating a lot of articles based on just not using mesh terms. So, or I'm not saying this is not mesh term, but I'm saying if this is not a mesh term, I'm, let, let's check if MDD is a mesh term or not. It should be, right? Uh, yeah, they have M, this is, this is the mesh terms for MDD. 
right? Uh, so instead of using all this different terminology, uh, you can use only this one because it's, it's also case sensitive. It could be case sensitive. It could be the way uh, the terminology they have they have came, they have come up with. So they have a part of a major depressive disorder, but they have different versions of MDD as well, right? Or how they have put in there in the in the system. It's about how they catalog in the in the database. Did I answer that question? Yeah, that was uh, very insightful. Like you know, you kind of uh, showed us how how it works and how the results change. So that was yeah, really good. And also, there's uh, um, and there's another question: Is there any difference between um, the mesh terms and all fields in the PubMed? Okay, mesh terms and what else? All fields. All fields. Okay. Uh, when we when you go into advanced section yes i believe so right there yeah 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 so basically if you see all fields like uh they have all fields like it, it doesn't just cover the mesh terms it has uh when it was published in what journal it was published and and, and the language it was right so basically when you are going to into look into advanced uh search criteria you can play with that but uh, all fields won't help you to uh build your methodology section uh for your system review or any review article like uh, all feels like it, it it helps you to filter out like by author like for example like if you know any author in particular uh where, who, who has done a lot of work in a in a particular area then you can always uh search that author and 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 then it will list out all the particular uh publications uh related to that author right uh but um, it won't add any value in terms of uh, looking into literature if you are looking into uh, publishing or, or even doing the literature review in itself, right? Uh, we are not much concerned about everything else. Like we are concerned about like getting maximum number of uh, uh, articles related to the topic that we are interested in. Got it. Thank you so much. Dr. Shah, another question that I have for you is like uh, when we are applying for residency, right? So a lot of students uh, face this difficulty. Are non-PubMed index articles as important for resi residency application as the PubMed ones? Like what is the value they hold? Uh, so as far as definitely having PubMed indexed or, or uh, it's, it's very valuable because it it. It, it can say that like it's, it's a legit work. Uh, uh, the journal that you are publishing in, uh, it's PubMed index. That means that the journal is there for at least two years uh, in the business. Uh, it, 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 and it publishes regularly because to get PubMed index for any particular journal, it takes time. If I come with a journal, I cannot index in PubMed immediately. Um, uh, so that's one thing, right? That it, it, it validates that you have published in a good good journal or at least a journal which has been out there for a while. Uh, second thing is a um, uh, lot of uh, like what what we use for search, right? We use like mostly PubMed or or, or uh, PubMed Central uh, or Medline. So basically, all of them has PMID. Or like if you can see here, PMID is there. So uh, that that definitely uh, that our work is going to be here. And it, it is going to be read by a lot of people, um, and a lot of I, I would say like a lot of programs or, or faculty, um, you know, they are definitely into research, but they might not be aware about non PubMed uh, uh, or PMID related uh, publications. So kind of you are going to filter it out, and also I guess in in your CV application uh, there is a section called call like. PMID or you can put the PubMed ID uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, so uh, that helps that, okay, there is a PubMed ID that you have uh, uh, associated with your work. Also, when you are going to be in residency, um, like ACGME, they, uh, they have their uh, uh, record keeping thing that yearly they will, they will put the records of the residents and how much they have published. Uh, so they will ask for PubMed or PMID in there. So basically, you know, I think it's a system like uh, uh, or, or, or not just a system, but also like it's widely acceptable that we publish in PubMed ID. Uh, it should be in good journal. Like uh, uh, 
Um, there are a lot of new journals which are coming out by good publish publication uh, centers, and and uh, they are new, so they don't have PubMed ID, but uh, uh, they might be good. They, they might be good publishers. Uh, so it's okay to publish in something which is not uh, PubMed indexed. But I would always encourage that you, as an applicant, um, uh, we should go with the PubMed ID. Thank you, Dr. Shah. That was very insightful. Uh, another question in the chat box is that uh, when you're choosing a topic, how do you decide whether to do a systemic review or a literature review? You know, how do you come up to that decision? Uh, so it also depends on the topic, right? So if there is if there is a lot of evidence uh, for a particular topic, uh, then we might have a good number of uh, clinical trials out there, and good number of evidence uh, related to the particular topic. So we have enough of data. To kind of summarize that so i think that is that makes a very good topic for a systemic review but if there is a very novel uh topic like for example at the beginning of covid right we didn't know much about the covid and and if you want to do systemic review it's not possible it's not feasible and, and that brings to the equation or or the thing that we discussed that our question or research question should be feasible um so uh if we don't have much things to review and write about how we're going to write about so if if we don't uh, if our topic is too new uh, then even on a small narrative review uh, or uh, or commentary really helps to get our work out there thank you dr shah thank you um, another question that i found um, which is a great question too. Like, how, what is the criteria that we choose to um, select a suitable journal for submission? So, like, I know it's like a very, um, I would say, like, it's very tricky to answer this question. Uh, but it all depends on uh, topic, right? Uh, what we are targeting, or what level of what kind of uh, audience we are targeting for sure and there are journals which will take any topics uh, related to any field right so those are those kind of journals and there are journals which are very specific to your particular field right uh, so it depends that if you want to publish it in in uh, in a journal which is just specific to your uh, field if it is yes then like the level of work that you are going to end up doing it might be uh, it should be to the to the level that it will be acceptable because they have experts of that particular field. I'm not saying that they don't have experts like the journal which accepts all the articles from all the fields. They don't have experts. They also they also have experts, but like uh, field related or area specific journals, uh, they have uh, experts particularly doing uh, uh, all their life uh, and they have studied that topic or related those topics all their lives so i think uh, um uh, when publishing like for example if i want to publish something in a cap right it might not be easy because a cap is a journal like challenge uh, and psychiatry and and uh, my work will be reviewed by experts and they will definitely i'm pretty sure that they are going to come up with a lot of comments and I, I, my level of work should be to the point that they are going to even review it uh, uh, if I feel my level of work is not that, then like uh, they will say well, this is not something suitable to our journal, and they are they're going to reject it upfront, and they are not going to even waste waste their time uh, reviewing that article or, or my submission. Um, so that is something you need to kind of be aware about. Um, uh, and and when we start, you know, like you definitely we want to have some success, right? So. Uh, uh, impact factor, right? We talk about impact factor. Every journal has an impact factor. What it means that, you know, um, publications that are published in that particular journal, how many times they have cited, you know, they have formula uh, out there. Every year they, they calculate the impact factor. So you can see that your level of work is, you know, good, but you are not sure like uh, whether it's, it's going to be like uh, very, uh, uh, very insightful uh, in a way that uh, uh, your work will be read by a lot of uh, other experts, then uh, you might want to end up submitting a journal which has like one or two uh, impact factor journals. So that gives uh, um, you know, some idea. Also like uh, submission, it's, it's an experience as well. Like, you know, you won't know actually until you submit. 
So it's okay to take sometimes risk and, and say, okay, you know, I'm going to go with the high impact factor journal and see how it goes. Uh, and in fact, it helps to kind of uh, improve our manuscript. Uh, we, it might not end up, ended up, uh, end up being published in that particular journal, but the feedback that might receive from, from the other journals can be, uh, can be used to improve our manuscript and submit somewhere else. And that's fine, you know, because uh, we are not done with the manuscript until it gets published. So that's, that's very important. Thank you, Dr. Shah, for all your insightful answers. I think we can continue with the letter, of, uh, letter to editor now. Sure, that's great. Um, So this, this will be brief. I know we talked about later to editor, right? So what is later to editor? Uh, uh, I'm going to give you one example um, uh, related to the later to editor that I did uh, a couple of years ago. So, you know, uh, we usually read articles, right? We, we look into articles, we say, okay, that's, that's interesting article. Uh, but if you know about research, if you know, if, if, if what is what should be the methodology section, right? Uh, then we might be able to find some, you know, deficiencies in that particular article. Um, and that's called reply to letter to editor, right? Uh, it's not commentary. It's letter to editor means like, you know, you're replying to an existing work which was published. Uh, so I read this article, which is wonderfully written in, in a very reputable journal. Um, and, uh, I found in methodology, right? Because the methodology is something like, which helps to replicate their work uh, and see whether they have done uh, according to the guidelines. Uh, and I found some deficiencies. I said, okay, you know, I, this is something I can highlight and, and make other readers aware about it. So I reached out to this particular journal and, and then and talked about, hey, you know, I want to write down a letter uh, and, and kind of, uh, let your readers aware that there are some uh, deficiencies in methodology section of this particular article, and and they agreed. Usually, the letter or reply to letter to editor or reply to a letter uh, or a publication um, should be done within like three or six months. It depends on what uh, journal is that. So you always check with the journal that it, are you going to accept or even review my submission if I do do so. So this was published. And I read uh, that article and I found out that uh, they agreed that, yeah, I can go ahead and submit my work. Uh, so I submitted my work and uh, it got accepted. Uh, so this letter to editor regarding the article, uh, about the article that I read. Um, and the issues that I found, like, Couple of issues where there, you know, they have they have mentioned in their methodology that, that they have used mesh terms, but they were not actually mesh terms. So definitely, that's uh, uh, something that we 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 highlighted. Uh, then they also didn't use the boolean operators and search strings like I talked about and or or right. Also, they didn't use the parentheses that they had to use you know, in a particular manner uh, because when I go into their uh, methodology section, you no, know, can I replicate that thing? I was not able to replicate that. That means that there's something or uh, deficiency, right? Um, in, in that. Uh, then uh, uh, they had Prisma flowchart, and uh, the Prisma flowchart had some deficiencies as well, like uh, what they have mentioned about number of screen articles uh, and the actual articles, they were different. So I found like few of them, right? Like it's a great article. I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, reading that article, learned a lot. Uh, but at the same time, I found some deficiencies and I, I wanted to highlight that. And that and it's not about publication, it's about, you know, your level of interest. Like we are not here trying to uh, kind of point other people that, hey, you know, you didn't do the good job. It's not our goal. Uh, it's, it's The goal is that, you know, uh, like we highlight that deficiencies so that you know, authors knows about it, readers knows about it, and, and journalists are aware about it as well, because uh, it's important that, like, um, we don't mislead anyone, right, uh, when we write anything. Uh, that should not be our goal. Um, our goal should be to be very open about what we are writing, uh, very transparent uh, about our methodology section, 
all the all the research has a section called or publication has a section called limitations right so every research publication has a limitation or research has a lim limitations uh, and and it's okay to have that uh, only thing is like we want to make sure that uh, we are transparent about everything and and if that if our article doesn't uh, reflect that then uh, then someone else can write up later to editor to for our article right uh, so it, uh, and also it helps us to understand research methodology and, and research in, in general a lot, right? If you know, if you feel like you are good with bar statistics, uh, you can look into statistical aspect of it, right? Like if you, if you can say, you know, oh yeah, this this particular uh, uh, thing that you have used or or, or 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 the analysis you have done definitely helps you to uh, justify or, or or look into your objective. But you know, this might be better, or this might help help you to kind of. Uh, further take a step ahead, you know. Uh, uh, so those kind of stuff, you know. So knowing uh, your uh, research concepts uh, uh, is very important. And uh, if you know that, then you can you can uh, write the letter to editor. And that's the reason you always collaborate with people because everyone has that your unique way of thinking, and and they can add their value uh, when they. Um, when they read the article and say, okay, yeah, this this finds interesting. At the same time, this this feel like you know we need to address this in our letter to editor. So always collaborate. You know, it's always good to have more people um, when you are working in a research. You know, ha having an extra set of eyes looking in, into your work is always good. Um, and uh, uh, you can come up with something like letter to editor like this. You know, and and it gets published very easily. You know, and this got published like in maybe a couple of weeks, oh, it didn't take much time. Uh, so, uh, and you know, when you are reading any particular article, it increases your knowledge, right? That's the main goal of our research or publication. It should increase our knowledge. Uh, and and uh, you can practice evidence-based. Uh, and, and I think that's really helpful for us to kind of, uh, not, not just to do the clinical work, but at the same time, you know, you can, you can learn research concepts uh, while, while doing your work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shah, for this insightful, uh, insightful. I mean, uh, you know, the topic. Um, I mean, I I wished we had more time to kind of, you know, talk more about the research and we have a lot of questions still. Um, but again, thank you so much. And uh, in view of time, I would invite Dr. Mansuri to say a few words. Thank you so much, Kaushal, for giving this insightful talk. For people who couldn't listen to the whole thing for whatever technical issue, please make sure you listen to the recording. He has given a comprehensive way to do a literature review. So please do that. We'll be posting the video soon, hopefully within a day or two. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, go to our Insta, and we'll keep posting our updates there. But in interest of time, we'll have to unfortunately say goodbye to Dr. Shah right now. We wanted more time with him, but we'll hopefully bring him back for a different session. So thank you so much, Dr. Shah. Sure. Well, uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you.